Our chapel speaker this morning is Mr. Lehman. Mr. Lehman is the Meigs family head of school and is celebrating his 10th year at the Hill. He's the 11th head of school and Hill's 171 years. Mr. and Ms. Lehman live in Farrow House, adjacent to the King Street gates, and have three children. Mitch graduated from Hill in 2016 and is now a professional rock climbing guide in the New River Gorge National Park in Fayetteville, West Virginia. Griff, a member of the Hill class of 2018, is a senior at Dartmouth College studying engineering and plays football for Big Green. Their daughter Avery is a freshman at Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, where she plays lacrosse for the Bobcats. And of course, there's Reuben. Mr. Lehman? Understanding our relationship with place matters. On long car rides when I was a little kid, my brother, mother, and I would play a game that my mother had grown up playing with her father called geography. My mom would start the game by naming a place. It could be a country, city, state, or province. And then I would have to name a place that started with the last letter of the place that my mom had said. And then my brother would have to name a place that started with the last letter of the place that I had named, and so on. We'd keep going until two of us got knocked out of the game by either accidentally repeating a place that had already been used or by getting stumped by a last letter. For instance, my mom might start with Pennsylvania, and I would have to name a place that started with the last letter. Good job. So I would say Atlanta, or better yet, I'd say Ajax. It's a city in Ontario, because it was much harder for my brother to come up with a place that started with the letter X. In between car trips, I'd study an atlas. Hopefully, you know what that is. And a gazetteer. Pretty sure that there's no way any of you know what that is. To build up a mem memorized list of places that ended and started with the hard letters. X, Y, and Z, mostly. So I could stump my competitors and avoid being stumped myself. Anybody have a good place starting with the letter X? Xanadu, that's my favorite in Utah. Excellent. Good job, Nicholas. At first, playing geography was mostly just a fun and competitive way to pass the time in the car, especially since smartphones and cellular networks were not even a thing yet, not even close. At some point, however, it became more than just memorizing a list of stumpers, and I began to get curious about those places all around the world and the people that live there. Between that growing curiosity and extensive travel with my family, it made sense that I ended up majoring in geography in college. Yes, you can major in geography in college. And no, it's not just a bunch of college students playing the aforementioned game. For most of us, the primary time that we study geography is in middle school. And the subject matter is typically physical geography how the Earth's land is placed, used, and mapped, focusing on topics like continents, uh, country boundaries, states or provinces and their capitals, climate, soil, and bodies of water. However, geogra geography courses in college tend to focus and explore human geography, an investigation of the relationship between people and place in terms of economics, politics, culture, language, religion, immigration, and pretty much any other social condition you can imagine. From my earliest days playing geography with my family, through college, and certainly still today, that interconnectedness between humans and the places which they inhabit, understanding our relationship with place, fascinates me. When I meet new people, my passion for geography often prompts me to frame initial conversations using a series of fundamental place questions that can tell you a lot about a person. Where were you born? Where do you live? Where are you from? And where do you feel most at home? Think about those questions for a moment and your own answers. Where were you born? Where do you live? Where are you from? And where do you feel most at home? For me, the answers are pretty straightforward. I was born in New York City. I live in Pottstown. I am from Baltimore, 
and I feel most at home when I am in Aquasic, Maine, on the shores of Lake Muslik Makuntik. Anybody want to give it a try? Anybody? Do I have to call on someone? Right here. There we go. Hayden, where, are you, where were you born? I was born in Greenwich, Connecticut. Greenwich, Connecticut. Where do you live? Where are you from? And where do you feel most at home? Home with your family. Thank you. Understanding our relationship with place matters. Attending and working at Hill is like a crash course and a living experiment in human geography. Think about it. Our little school, located in a small town in Pennsylvania, spanning a few acres on this hilltop urban utopia. It includes individuals from approximately 40 countries and almost every American state who speak different languages, practice various religions, espouse diverse and often competing political beliefs, and embrace a wide range of cultural and philosophical ideologies. In any other place, that diversity would be, well, divisive. And yet, we generally get along here at Hill perhaps due to the so-called so first law of geography, established by renowned geography professor Waldo, Waldo Tobler, which states, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. During your time at Hill, whether you have just arrived, you're beginning your second, third, or final year, or you've lived on this campus for your whole life as a faculty or staff child, you have become close to your classmates, your teachers, your dorm parents, your coaches, and your advisors. While you may have started as distant things from faraway places and different walks of life, you were drawn together by the hill, and today you are near things, and you are thus more related to each other, according to Professor Tobler. Understanding our relationship with place matters. As you likely know, today is our first full community in-person chapel meeting since March, since March 2nd, 2020. During that final pre-pandemic chapel meeting, our speaker was Mrs. Dolhoff. Just a few days later, Hill students left for spring break and our world was turned upside down by the COVID-19 pandemic. Ironically, Mrs. Dolhoff's chapel talk was entitled change is hard. As I recall, she spoke about how different people dealt with change, some adjusting better than others, and referenced changes like moving to a new home or a new school, learning in new ways, upgrading to the latest technology, and the like. In that moment, I don't think any of us could have anticipated the kind of changes which we all have lived through and continue to adjust to over the last 19 months. Zoom, remote learning, masks, physical distancing, testing, vaccines, and travel restrictions, not to mention the simultaneous and related political, economic, racial, and social upheaval and strife. Because of all that change, we are almost an entirely different world, country, and school today, both figuratively and literally. And in my 10 years at Hill, I have learned that our students and faculty have a greater than average resistance to change. Because of our traditional atmosphere and history, I believe Hill attracts individuals who prefer structure, rules, expectations, and the related comfort of routines. Personally, I enjoy change. In fact, I'm so comfortable with change that people frequently call me a change agent, a term used to describe somebody who helps an organization transform how it operates by promoting and delivering critical changes in strategy, tactics, personnel, and culture. When I was hired at Hill 10 years ago, the Hill Board of Trustees charged me with making a wide range of ambitious institutional changes, including changes to our curriculum, campus facilities, global reputation, and financial sustainability. As you can imagine, some of those changes were immensely popular with students, faculty, parents, and alumni. And some were equally or even more unpopular within our community. Understanding our relationship with place 
matters. As I reflected on Hill's response to the pandemic and the plethora of changes that we made to keep the school open and safe last year, and, I, and as I compared our response to that of other schools, a few things occurred to me. Hill made major changes more quickly than ever before. Changes were made with limited resistance or debate, and many of these changes seemed easier to implement because we already had begun to accept a culture of change at Hill, or at least had stopped distancing, excuse me, at least had stopped dismissing change simply for the sake of not changing. A modified block schedule with 80-minute classes? Sure. A six-week remote age term? Why not? Rearranging dorms by athletic teams for the winter session? No problem. An outdoor production of Into the Woods? Of course. Watching recordings of Chapel by Advisory? No sweat. Graduation on the quad in a torrential downpour with no tent for parents? Well, that may have gone a bit too far. In the end, because of these changes, Hill accomplished something that an infinitesimally small number of schools in the world were able to do. We went to school. We played sports. We lived in dormitories. We held concerts. We made friends. We had weekend activities. We had shared experiences. We ate in the dining hall. We rode bikes. We toured and interviewed prospective admission families. We welcomed a nationally known comedian and laughed. We remained healthy. We grew in every possible way. We stayed together in this place. And gradually, and at times imperceptibly, we changed. Was that change hard? Yes. Do we ever want to do that again? Absolutely not. But in my opinion, and with all due respect to the title of Mrs. Dolhoff's chapel talk, change is only as hard as you make it. You can resist change, or you can embrace it. When faced with change, you can say, no way, never. Or you can say, sure, why not? I'll give that a shot. But either way, changes are going to keep coming at us, and our ability to adapt for the greater good comes from the strength of our community, our unique geography, and our unparalleled sense of place at the Hill. For what it's worth, chapel talks are a great vehicle for understanding our relationship with place and contemplating life's many inevitable changes. As we've already seen last week, chapel talks can explore and provide advice for navigating the complex topics of adolescence. They can introduce you to people that you might have never otherwise met. Chapel talks can and should be inspirational, humorous, mysterious, prayerful, and reflective. They can advocate for societal change, both here on campus and beyond. Chapel Talks can recount interesting personal stories and offer life lessons. And without question, Chapel Talks can be celebratory. Today, I've tried to do a little bit of all of that. I hope that at the end of your time here, after being together in this beautiful chapel, listening to the exceptional voices and experiences of your classmates and faculty, you too will make Hill part of your personal geography and carry that sense of place with you forever. And if you ever want to challenge me to a game of geography, give it your best shot. I still have my list of X, Y, and Z stumpers ready to go. Thank you and have a great day.